In this video, we're finally going to see some addition reactions that are irreversible. So far, we've focused on reactions that are actually all reversible uh, when they add to the carbonyl. So we've seen um, hydration reactions where uh, water reacts with a carbonyl. We've seen acetal formation where alcohols react with the carbonyl. And we've seen imine and enamine formation where amines react with the carbonyl. And all of these reactions, um, you can regenerate the carbonyl uh, by essentially shifting the equilibrium and adding, um, in essence, water to many of these uh, in acidic conditions. Um, however, when we take a look at reactions of organometallic reagents with the carbonyls, these are irreversible reactions and they produce alcohols. And so we're going to see this is a great way of being able to synthesize many different types of alcohols. The common um, organometallic reagents we're going to focus on are um, organolithium and um, Grignard reagents. And so uh, here I have an organolithium reagent and it reacts with the carbonyl. We see that the carbonyl carbon, um, it has a partial positive charge. And so the uh, organolithium attacks that carbon, displacing a carbon-oxygen double bond. The result is uh, a lithium alkoxide. And when we treat that alkoxide with aqueous acidic conditions, uh, we can protonate it, and the result is an alcohol, right? So these are um, very easy ways of making alcohols from uh, aldehydes and ketones, right? Reacting an al uh, organolithium reagent with an aldehyde or a ketone and producing alcohols. So the second uh, organometallic reagent is a Grignard reagent. And of course, uh, we're going to see that the behavior of Grignards uh, parallels the behavior of organolithiums. Um, it, again, the carbonyl carbon is partial positive, so we get attack of the organometallic reagent to that carbon, displacing a carbon-oxygen bond. And again, the result is an alkoxide. The only difference is the salt that's generated, obviously. Uh, and so, again, we can protonate this with an aqueous acid, and we generate an alcohol. So the, you know, the, the take home is um, that uh, organolithium reagents and Grignard reagents react the exact same way. Um, also, a thing to consider is that this is always a two-step process and you have to show it as such uh, in the reagents. So the first step always forms the alkoxide and then the second step is a proton transfer um, from the acid to the alkoxide, and so you get protonation to occur. The reason that we have to show it in two steps is because if water were present in the first step, so you know, notice what we're doing here. We're reacting a Grignard with a carbonyl. There is no water present. That's the first step. Then the second step, we're introducing water. And the reason for that is because, remember, if, if we add water to that first step, well, the Grignard reagent or organolithium reagent is a strong base. And so it protonates, uh, water will protonate the organometallic reagent. And this is how we always set it up. Notice our carbonyl, aldehyde or ketone, first reacts with a Grignard or um, organolithium reagent followed by a second step where you're introducing water or um, an aqueous uh, acid, okay? So, and it doesn't really matter if it's water or H3O plus, either one of them is gonna protonate the alkoxide and you generate the alcohol. So we can design syntheses of very specific classes of alcohols. Remember a primary, uh, secondary, or a tertiary alcohol. And if we think about how we can go about doing this, we can take a Grignard or organolithium. Remember, um, either one of these behave the exact same way. And if we react one of these organometallic reagents with formaldehyde, again, we're going to generate the alcoxide. Um, and notice 
there's a CH2 group, and then upon protonation, we get um, RCH2OH. So this is a, a, a nice way of making a primary alcohol. Now, if we take a Grignard reagent or an organolithium reagent and react it with any other type of aldehyde where you have an R group coming off of, uh, of that carbonyl carbon instead of uh, two hydrogens, uh, then again, you're gonna generate the alkoxide and upon addition of water or an acid, now I have generated a secondary alcohol where you have two R groups coming off. One uh, of the R groups was from the aldehyde itself. The other R group was from the Grignard reagent. And then lastly, if I take a ketone and react it with a Grignard where I have two R groups coming off of that carbonyl uh, and those R groups can be the same or they could certainly be different, right? So I've designated one R group blue and one R group red. I generate the alkoxide, add water, and I get now a tertiary alcohol. So you see that, you know, if we, if we understand what we want to make in terms of our, our synthetic goal, then we kind of know how uh, we can go about getting there from uh, particular reagents, be it a ketone, an aldehyde, or formaldehyde. So keep that in mind, you know, when, when you have a secondary alcohol that you want to make, you should be thinking, oh, I can make this from a Grignard reagent and an aldehyde. If you have a tertiary alcohol that you want to make, you can make it from a Grignard reagent and a ketone. So let's look at some examples. Here I have benzaldehyde, and it's reacting with propyl magnesium bromide. The way that you name Grignard reagents is you name the alkyl group followed by magnesium bromide. Naming um, organolithiums is the you name the alkyl group followed by lithium. So if this was an organolithium, it'd be propyl lithium. Here we have propyl magnesium bromide uh, in ether. Typical solvent is ether or THF. Um, and then again, followed by that aqueous workup. And so what's going to happen? Well, the, the uh, propyl group is going to add to that carbonyl. Uh, it, we're starting with an aldehyde with, uh, so an aldehyde with the Grignard is going to produce a secondary um, alcohol, right? So we have a secondary alcohol here. Notice um, the uh, carbonyl is converted to an alcohol and I've added uh, that three carbon chain from the uh, Grignard reagent. Right, so it produces a secondary alcohol. Aldehydes with Grignards or organolithiums produce secondary alcohols. Here I have a ketone and I'm treating it with benzyl lithium in THF, <coughs> again followed by an aqueous workup. And so what am I going to form here? You should you know, start thinking about what you can form. If you're reacting a ketone with a, an organometallic reagent, you're going to get a tertiary alcohol. What happens? That benzylic carbon adds to the carbonyl, right? The carbon-oxygen bond breaks, and uh, F, upon protonation, you get an OH group. So there's that OH group. Uh, notice you know, the way that I typically like to, to think about drawing these is I draw out the um, aldehyde or the ketone kind of backbone. I convert the uh, carbonyl into an OH, and then I simply add the um, alkyl group or aryl group from the, uh, from the organometallic reagent onto it. Right? So this is the tertiary alcohol that is produced in that step, right? And an, another example, I have, an, again, an aldehyde um, reacting with cyclopentyl magnesium bromide in ether, followed by an aqueous workup. So notice it's always one, step one, step two. If I don't put that one and the two there, then that means that I'm mixing my Grignard reagent with water, and I'm not going to actually produce the alcohol that I want. So I would expect to get a secondary alcohol. And this is something you always want to kind of check yourself. Did I produce a secondary alcohol? Well, when I react it, again, I'm drawing out the, the aldehyde backbone. I convert the carbonyl into an OH, 
and then I add that cyclopentyl group to it, right? And that's a secondary alcohol. <clears throat> In the last uh, um, section, we looked at metal hydrides as well, and these also, re uh, also add to carbonyls irreversibly. So uh, typical um, uh, reagents that we use are sodium borohydride and lithium aluminum hydride, so NaBH4 or LiAlH4, right? These are two very common hydrides that um, are going to be used throughout. And the structure of these um, actually is very similar to one another. With sodium borohydride, you have a sodium ion, right? These are salts. So you have a sodium ion, and then you have a borohydride anion. And the borohydride anion is a tetrahedral um, ion uh, where the negative charge is on the boron. But this is a hydride donor, so it, it donates um, a hydrogen plus a pair of electrons, okay? And it actually can donate four hydrides. Lithium aluminum hydride looks very similar, right? It's also a salt with lithium cation and then the uh, aluminum hydride anion where the negative charge is on the aluminum. So these two behave um, very similarly in their outcome. <clears throat> and the way that this works is that um, uh, we, we've kind of alluded to these reagents um, already where if I take uh, aluminum hydride and uh, I put it in, in water, I actually get a reaction that takes place where the hydride um, will remove a proton from water and I generate hydrogen gas plus um, the uh, aluminum uh, trihydride hydroxide uh, anion. And of course, this can happen three times more, right? Three more times because there are three more hydrides there. And, and in the end, I can produce four equivalents of hydrogen um, from one equivalent of aluminum hydride. So I can produce four moles of hydrogen from one mole of aluminum hydride. Uh, and then the, the final result is I get this aluminum uh, hydroxide salt. All right, so in terms of um, their behavior toward, uh, toward carbonyl compounds, they, in essence, donate a hydride. Uh, and so I can kind of, um, you know, simplify this structure a little bit. It's quite a bit more complex than, than I'm showing it because in actuality, um, you, you form these um, uh, esters of the uh, borohydride esters or aluminum hydride esters. But um, for, for now, I just want you to think about uh, these, these two reagents donating a hydride. That hydride attacks the carbonyl carbon, just like uh, Grignard reagents do, right? So the anion attacks the carbonyl carbon, displacing that carbon-oxygen bond, you generate an alkoxide. So again, just like organometallic reagents. And if of course, when we uh, protonate that with water, um, then we get our alcohols. Now notice, um, if I use formaldehyde here uh, with a hydride, I can generate uh, methanol. Uh, and so I'm not adding a, an R group to it, I'm adding a hydrogen to that carbonyl. So again, if I think about um, what happens if I have another type of aldehyde present, hydride adds to that uh, carbonyl carbon, I form the alkoxide, the alkoxide can then get protonated, and I generate a primary alcohol, right? So aldehydes get reduced, this is a reduction, with um, borohydride or aluminum hydride, they get reduced to primary alcohols, right? Aldehydes get reduced to primary alcohols. And of course we can have a ketone uh, reacting with a hydride and when that happens, uh, again the hydride attacks the carbonyl carbon, displacing that carbon-oxygen bond. I form the alkoxide, add that to water, and I generate a secondary alcohol, right? So here I have reduction of ketones producing secondary alcohols, 
ketones produce secondary alcohols, aldehydes produce primary alcohols. So uh, there is a, a little difference uh, between uh, sodium borohydride and lithium aluminum hydride. Uh, one of the biggest differences is uh, their reactivity. Sodium borohydride is much milder uh, reducing agent than lithium aluminum hydride. And you know, because of this, we'll see later on that uh, sodium borohydride won't reduce certain things that lithium aluminum hydride will. Uh, but for now, the, the biggest thing is um, the reaction conditions. Sodium borohydride can be run in alcohols as solvents. It can even be run in water as solvents because uh, its reaction toward water and toward alcohols is a lot slower. And as a matter of fact, um, this makes it pretty easy because, uh, because we can use the alcohol or water as our proton source. So the alkoxide forms and then can be protonated from the solvent, right? And we don't have to add any additional um, acid to that. Lithium aluminum hydride, on the other hand, is very reactive toward water. And as a matter of fact, um, you can get uh, um, ignition from the hydrogen gas being uh, being evolved from that reaction. Uh, and therefore, you can't run any reactions with lithium aluminum hydride in water. They have to be run in ether or THF, followed by the addition of water to protonate the alkoxide. So uh, here are here's a typical kind of setup of a reaction where I have um, a ketone and I'm reacting with sodium borohydride in methanol. So notice I'm using methanol as a solvent. One other thing to note about this example is I have um, another pi bond. And so we should always be thinking about, well, if, if uh, a reagent can reduce one pi bond, can it reduce another? Think about hydrogen. Hydrogen will reduce a or, uh, an alkene, pi bond, it will also reduce a carbonyl pi bond as well, and you get alcohols. So if I were to simply add um, hydrogen to this, I actually get reduction of both the carbonyl group and the pi bond of the alkene. Sodium borohydride does not reduce an alkene. And so the product is this, right? So you see that the the carbon-carbon double bond stays where it is, and I simply generate an alcohol. Notice a secondary alcohol from a ketone. Here I have an aldehyde, and, and again, notice the reagent setup. If I use lithium aluminum hydride, I have to run it in two steps. The first step is in ether, followed by the addition of water. Okay, so very important to understand the, the subtle differences between reagent setup. Sodium borohydride typically run in alcohols. Lithium aluminum hydride has to be run in ether followed by an aqueous workup. Since we have uh, an aldehyde here, we're going to generate a primary amine. And uh, of course we do. So this is a great way of taking benzaldehyde, notice, and making benzyl alcohol. And so this is, uh, so we've seen now um, two different types of reactions of, uh, of organometallic reagents, so to speak, with uh, carbonyl compounds. And all of them produce uh, alcohols. So now we have quite an arsenal uh, of ways of making different types of alcohols. And you need to practice this because this is what we're going to be doing a lot of in the next few weeks.